My name is uh, Joe Bruni. Today's date is April 23rd, 2003. And this is tape two. Okay, Joe, we talked about the Battle of Tinian. Uh, what did you do after Tinian? Well, of course, uh, we headed back to our advanced base in uh, Maui in the Hawaiian Islands. There again, uh, we had a, about a week just to recoup and uh, get uh, adjusted. To, and uh, of course, there we were able to uh, eventually, naturally, uh, as we did after the other campaigns, we, we had orientations where we, we had to learn about maybe uh, things that we should be doubly aware of uh, with our experiences on the uh, island of Saipan and Tinian. And uh, of course, we tried at this time, along with the training, to have more of a recreational setup. Now, uh, the rumor was, after Saipan and Tinian, that we were going to be uh, headed stateside or that we were going to get some leave. But unfortunately, it was only a rumor. Uh, in the Marine Corps, it seems that R&R, &R, which supposedly stands for Rest and Recreation, with the Marine Corps, it's replacements and replacements. <laughs> So therefore, that uh, rumor was killed in the butt, and uh, we uh, regrouped, retrained, and uh, we were now assigned to the different regiments. The combat engineers, we work like with the 23rd Regiment in one campaign, with the 24th uh, Regiment in uh, the Saipan Tinian, and the 25th, we found out we were going to work uh, on the next one which was uh, Iwo Jima. But uh, this time the camp was, even though rather primitive, was a little more set up than uh, the, the, the previous uh, months that uh, we set up our uh, tent camp. We, we had a baseball field now, or like the equivalent, and so there were a few more recreational activities for us. And uh, of course we had a, a, a boxing ring too, but that, uh, and uh, for, fortunately once in a while, uh, a uh, USO troop would come. So even though we were very primitive, still in tent camp, uh, uh, outdoor uh, uh, movies, uh, sitting on sandbags, and if it rained, well, it didn't bother us. We were used to rain because we were used to having rain even in our foxholes. Uh, so, uh, but then, uh, then, as I said, after Saipan, the demolition seemed to get special uh, emphasis. Well, prior to our invasion of Iwo, of course, we didn't know it at uh, this time that it, it was going to be Iwo, uh, but they realized that the Japanese were well fortified, that they had a system of caves and tunnels and underground uh, entrenchments, pillboxes and things of that type that uh, we had to uh, realize, and especially as we got closer to the mainland. If you, you study the, the, the mount, map of the South Pacific, Saipan is, uh, is quite close to, uh, well, Okinawa is, is on, the le on the left, but quite close to, to the mainland of Japan. And later, knowing Iwo, Iwo was only 750 miles from the mainland of, 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 of Japan. So the concentration was more on demolitions, satchel charges, Bangalore torpedoes. I mean, it was getting so that uh, uh, the emphasis uh, was on demolition of, of fortifications, uh, of Jap entrenchments. And uh, OK. Uh, then, then we had the ship to shore. You know, even though we had what we would call the, the combat experience, you have to remember we also had heavy casualties, heavy casualties. So it was a question of replacements. And towards prior to the Iwo Jima campaign, we were getting sometimes members who were wounded on Guadalcanal with the first Marines or uh, uh, 
uh, the campaigns of, of the other uh, uh, Marines, that uh, they would come in as replacements mm -hmm. for us. So in a way, we had more experienced uh, troops, but uh, the, the, and uh, without quoting a, a general, a, a, a general said, one Marine division that has seen combat is worth two Marine divisions stateside. So it's replacements, replacements, and we weren't going to go on any home leave or anything. Wow, that must have been tough. What about, tell us about the landing at, at Evo. That must have been something. Okay. Uh, here's the situation from my uh, personal experience and viewpoint. As we were approaching Iwo Jima with our troop ships and assault boats and, and uh, destroy and uh, Navy accompaniment naturally, uh, we were in zigzag fo formation, obviously, f throughout. And if you will note, you study from where we left, from Maui and the Hawaiian Islands. We had to pass the Marshall Islands. We had to pass the Marianas, which is Saipan and Tinian. And we had to continue on to Iwo Jima. So we're talking about a considerable number of sea miles in zigzag formation. But anyway, uh, the night before D-Day, it was about 2.45 in the morning. I had, and we were assigned hatch watches. We, we were assigned. I had just gotten off a two-hour watch uh, on deck. And uh, then down below to my troop compartment. And unfortunately, it always seems, being a PFC, see, I was promoted. Uh, I, I was a PFC at this time. We, we had our bunks. Uh, uh, very uh, low to the ground uh, and very uh, uh, congested uh, and generally next to the latrine or the heads. We call it the heads. And in many cases, many of them were malfunctioning and, and the swirl would come right below and you had a lower sack, uh, you know, uh, you were in for it. So. Uh, uh, in, in some cases, uh, I, I used to go topside, sneak into one of the life rafts uh, to get some fresh air and so on, but, but uh, 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 I was always discovered in the morning by the SPs and uh, or who, the officer of the day on watch, and, and of course, uh, that was uh, en route. But getting to the D-Day invasion. <clears throat> I just got off watch, just about to take my uh, boots off and, and hit the sack, when the ship got a terrific impact, and we thought, well, this is it, Jap torpedo. We caught a fish, and uh, man your battle stations. Manned your boarding stations. And of course, and I must say this, and not uh, because it's once again the pride of the Marines, but even in this crisis situation, there was not any real panic. I mean, we all rushed uh, uh, topside and so on, uh, even, and the ship uh, st started to, to, to list. And then we reported in the thick of night, 2, 2.45 in the morning, thick night, uh, uh, the ones on the starboard side could not, they had to still line up as much as they can on the hatch, but they could not eventually disembark because of the angle of the ship. And, uh, but uh, fortunately, uh, my station was on the port side, the left side. And we were lined up. Now, some, some Marines uh, jumped in because they really th thought we... But later, we found out it was in the zigzag formation. Our ships got too close, and one rammed. We rammed each other. And fortunately, they were 
pretty well locked in. And, and, and for some miracle, they were able to close off uh, the compartments. Of course, the compartments were flooded, and that's what gave the list. But we didn't realize at the time, but the ship was still seaworthy. So uh, then a destroyer pulls up and throws a light on our nets. And we thought, oh my God, this time we're really going to cap catch a Jap fish because we're right off I Iwo and so on. But fortunately, uh, things uh, were pretty well under control. They were able to rescue <laughs> some of those that jumped overboard and so on. And uh, uh, we had to stay aboard ship. And D-Day was the next morning. So uh, we could not get off. Our 20th Marines, the combat uh, our section, of course, they were, there's uh, Company A and Company B and other, other uh, combat Marines assigned to the other regiments. But we weren't able to get off. And uh, so, so this is the first operation I wasn't involved in D-Day because after D-Day, they came back, they were able to take us off the ship, and we went in D plus one early. Now here it is. The Japs let us get on the beaches pretty much. I'm not saying they're still, uh, you know, mortar, or to, but uh, they, they, for the most part, they let us get onto the beaches, but they had a reason. They knew where we landed, once again, was the only possible places to land. They had that area zeroed in from the northern end of uh, the island to Sarabachi. Remember, Sarabachi. And where we landed, and we knew we were going to be caught in a crossfire a crossfire from Sorobachi from the other and uh, because we and our objective was Motiyama Airfield number one, which was a short distance from some sh uh, Sorobachi, and they zeroed in, and so that the first week or so, I mean, and then the weather turned against us on D plus two, D plus three, the weather turned against us. The heavy shore, we, uh, it, it uh, disrupted uh, all our uh, craft. Uh, uh, we had to sit and basically take it. Now, sure, our 14th uh, artillery pieces, the 75s, were, were active, rain or shine. But, but um, for the most part, the engineers and good part of the infantry we were pretty well bogged in, in our foxhole and just taking it. And that's why we also had heavy uh, casualties. I understand it was kind of a black sandy. Oh yes, and and you really couldn't uh, dig what you would call the traditional type of foxhole because it would it would cave in uh, on the sides because of the loose uh, volcanic uh, soil uh, ash. Uh, uh, fortunately, I, uh, I'm not of a tall statues, so uh, any, any kind of hole or crater uh, would suffice for me. But, uh, uh, but then I learned that Joe Esposito landed on D-Day and was killed. Now, in the early phases of the operation, we can't bury our dead right away. So when we were holed up, not only about 50 yards or so, under a poncho was my buddy, Joe Esposito, under the poncho, in the rain. And I couldn't do a thing. I couldn't do a thing for him. Now, fortunately, we also had the 5th Marines. By this time, there was a 5th Marine and this was going to be their first combat experience. But they were responsible for Surabachi. They were responsible to cut, up, cut through that island. And of course, naturally with our assistance, because we were shelling Surabachi too, of course. Uh,
But fortunately, I guess it was D plus three or four after the rains, they were able to secure Suribachi. And, and, and mind you, this is another small island. Saipan was 13 and a half miles. Iwo Jima is only, what, five and a half by eight miles, the most? And you had heavy complement of Marines and 23,000 Japanese. Uh, but when that flag went up, and really, I saw that flag go up. I saw that flag go up. And, you know, just a bunch of kids like we were at a football game. That you could hear there was firing in the air. Uh, you could hear boat. Uh, you could hear everyone so excited about the fact that we supposedly secured Suribachi. But just to see the flag there, and also we knew, hopefully, hey, we're no longer trapped into a crossfire, or at least a heavy. There was there's still always. Uh, activity, no matter whether you put a flag up, there's caves and so on. And you get, but we knew at least we could concentrate now in the forward position to the northern end of the island, that uh, we didn't get involved with a crossfire. But still they knew, they zeroed in. And, and I'm not exaggerating, no matter where you were on this island, you'd say, well, the beaches by that D plus four, five, six, seven were more secure. No, because from the caves, and I'm not exaggerating, and I'm sure history will prove me right. I on on uh, one night, I I counted at least 19 to 20 rockets from the caves. They were like what we we call buzz bombs then, but of course they have a different significance today. But they would drop just about any anywheres. Uh, on on our positions, and, and that was the uncanny thing to, to see them. Now, fortunately, uh, in a way, uh, they kind of exposed themselves from the caves when they shot these rockets. So therefore, and this time now, we had destroyers coming in closer and cruisers coming in closer. So they would uh, support us by shelling these areas, but still. Uh, without going into uh, a lot of specific detail, because frankly, as a PFC, I mean, I was only involved in five yards at a time. Uh, I, I didn't see the big picture again, but then we realized how dug in the Japanese were, because even during daylight, lots of times, you didn't come across uh, mass troops like we did on Saipan and Tinian. I mean, in terms of uh, uh, Japanese tanks or counterattacks uh, of that type. No, everything, uh, they, they did most of their fighting at night, and they were terrific night fighters. These caves, had they, were they things they had hollowed out, or were they natural caves? Uh, natural, hollowed out. Remember, uh, the Japanese, I believe, had these islands, and they were assessed to them, uh, if I recall correctly from, you know, and this I only learned much later, uh, they had these islands for over 90 years. This was, Iwo Jima was considered part of their mainland. And they knew, uh, as the war progressed, they knew that uh, they had to fortify that island. Now, the rumor was we were going to invade Formosa, but the Navy was against that. They, they wanted it to go direct, and they needed it because we were losing, and this I learned later, they were losing our bombers who were taking off from Saipan and Tinian, and, uh, and uh, Iwo had a, a radar station that alerted the mainland so they knew when our bombers were coming over. And we had terrific losses. Uh, uh, and a, a matter of fact, we didn't even have, and then even fighter planes would take, Japanese fighter planes would take off from Iwo and cut our planes down. We were half crippled or uh, 
uh, didn't have enough gas or, or, you know, were heading for Saipan. So we had terrific losses. Now, there's one thing I'd like to say, and this is in the memory of the Marines who sacrificed themselves. At least uh, I'm talking about this particular campaign since you're talking uh, about Iwo Jima. It was proven that we, by getting Iwo, and even though naturally the, the war was going to end, uh, you know, months later, uh, that we saved much of them, about 30,000 crew and pilot lives, Air Force lives, by taking Iwo Jima. Although we lost 6,000 dead just for that little island. And how long did that battle go on, Joe? Yeah, there again, 26 days and 26 nights. You, you talk to people and, and you think, well, gee, that wasn't my... Concentrated day and night, and no matter where you were, killing, you couldn't bury your dead, uh, you didn't worry about the Jap dead. Uh, Because of the heavy weaponry that we experienced from their fortifications, we had more mutilation, more torn up bodies than we ever experienced on Saipan, Tinian, or any of our previous uh, operations. Everything was so concentrated. And I had told you, the few prisoners that we took and set up a little stockade at the beach, the shelling was too accurate. They killed their own few prisoners we had, and there were not many prisoners to be taken anyway. But uh, the, when we were clearing, and eventually, of course, we had to dig with, with the bulldozers, and this is, you know, the, 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 by this time, uh, we didn't have MOS uh, what you call specialties. Well, we did, but, but in the combat area, you didn't say, well, look, I, I'm supposed to just clear mines. That's my duty. No, we had a lot of things to do on Iwo. We were called uh, to, to, to assist the infantry, the, the, even the artillery, whether it was to bring up ammo or to bring up water or to uh, 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 help w with the reinforcements. Uh, like sandbagging uh, certain uh, artillery uh, installations. Uh, uh, I also, uh, the shortage of, of corpsmen, many corpsmen were killed. Uh, we had to assist with the wounded. And, uh, and I remember uh, we said uh, on the island, if we get hit, let's get hit during the day because evacuation might be more... Uh, readily uh, available, but you get hit at night because most people don't know that the ships pull out because they're targets at the beachhead, especially at night. Uh, uh, and also, uh, they had to protect uh, because uh, there were still uh, some engagements at sea, uh, but they fortunately came back in early dawn. Uh, LSTs and, and, and the supplies and the ammo. But the time, like I said, when we got that rain and we were really zeroed in, we couldn't get any supplies in. We couldn't get any supplies. And, and the surf was so heavy, it destroyed a, a lot of our equipment. The tractors uh, couldn't even get uh, on shore in the early stages because, as you pointed out, the, the soil composition was not conducive. We engineers, we had what we call metal ma uh, uh, mounts that we had to try to, but uh, under the, the combat conditions, it wasn't always feasible. Uh, you know, in other words, we, we laid these graded uh, metal mats so that the tractors could, could, could uh, go forward on them. But, uh, but uh, 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 the concentration of fire from the northern end of the island, and early from Sorobacha, but especially from the northern end, was, was very concentrated. And uh, so, but, w but then we got Modiyama Airfield, and then we were able to get more ammo and, and supplies and, and, and troops uh, and CBs. I have to give credit to the 
Seabees, the Navy Seabees, a mature uh, men skilled and trained, and they're the ones who helped out getting the airfield because, believe it or not, after a while, we were able, the ships from the carriers uh, that, that gave us uh, uh, low-level uh, support, uh, after a while, uh, other uh, fighter wings were able to land on Motiyama and, and just take off from Motiyama and drop their loads at the northern end of the island. So how, Miraculous. What, what's there, three airfields on, on Iwo? Uh, there was uh, the main one, Motiyama. Motiyama number two was com pretty well uh, constructed. And then there was a third one which was in the process oh, okay. of, uh, of being constructed. You did not have any Japanese air support, at air opposition to you there on Iwo, did you? Okay. Uh, at night, uh, one or two Bettys, we call them Bettys, would come through and drop their load. And that's another thing, just like on Roy and Amor, being a small island. No matter where they drop, uh, you know, they generally. And we cursed the full moon. We cursed the full moon because we knew we were definitely going to get air attacked. And the silhouette of the island with the fluorescent sure. ocean uh, was a perfect target. So. You stayed on, and the, you said 26 days, and then were you relieved by the Army? Uh, the Army, and, uh, and uh, they, well, then we got more uh, CVs, yeah. And then you backed off, and you, where did you go back then? Well, uh, fortunately, we went back to, 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 to Maui. Made a lot of trips to Maui. Oh, and how. I think, uh, uh, of course, we, we were with the Fleet Marines. But I tell you, uh, I think we had more sea duty than maybe the average sailor in World War II. I don't know. You, you uh, study your maps and you realize we're talking like destinations from, from uh, Maui to Roy and Amor, 3,479, and uh, don't quote me, uh, but it's over 3,000 sea miles just to Roy and Amor. And then you go to Saipan, which is further west. And mind you, you don't get off the ship. And I want to mention about an incident. I had, uh, when, we, uh, when we invaded Roy and the Moor, the Seventh Army invaded Kwajalein, another part of the Marshall Islands, and the Weetok, Parry Island, and so on. My older brother, my oldest brother, my brother Al, fortunately he's passed away recently, uh, he was with the Seventh Army. And when we secured Roy and the Moor, uh, he was able to get a supply boat. He was a sergeant. In the Army, you get promotions. You get, you just have a good conduct for six months, you get a stripe, but not in the Marine Corps. You have to drill a platoon, you have to know your manual, you have to do a lot of other things before you get your stripe. But anyway, uh, he, uh, but I had they had relieved us. The, the island was secured, and I went on this merchant ship, and we were uh, heading seaward. When my brother came to Roy and the Moor, and uh, this sounded a little surprising, he, he asked them, do you know Joe Bruni, or do you... Uh, and they did. I mean, there was people there, because the Marine Corps said, we're a small unit, you know, comparatively speaking. We work so close together. I mean, I knew my buddies better than my brothers, I have to admit. I mean, we have a close bond. And, uh, and they drill that into you. I mean, the teamwork. They stripped you in boot camp of your individuality, your personality. It's the teamwork. And if something, somebody goofs on the platoon, you're all punished. And the punishment, you know. Uh, not just KP duty. I mean, you had to scrape out toilets with a toothbrush and get a lot of harassment. Now, I don't know about the Marine Corps of today. I talked to some young Marines, and they said, well, yeah, there's the harassment, but not, they're not uh, able to treat us like we believe that they treated your generation. But anyway, so, so that was unfortunate. Uh, that I wasn't able to have a reunion uh, with my brother. Uh, but fortunately, through letters later, uh, I, I realized. What he had to do with the 7th Army, they were 
See, Roy and the Moors at the northern end of this atoll, and then there's a lot of series of little small islands, which the army eventually also had to uh, investigate, and there were Japs uh, on those small islands too. So uh, we went in through the lagoon, and we had to worry about tides, and that's why most of the times we, <laughs> we waded in, because the tides would shift. But, uh, and he ended up on, on Parry Island. And I th did I mention that uh, he was uh, on Parry Island when we were uh, going to invade Iwo? And uh, I had told my, and, and we picked up supplies off the Marshall Island, well, Pearl Harbor and, and uh, uh, the Marshall Islands, uh, and we picked up uh, other units of, of, of the fleet marine force. And I told my CO, I said, I have a brother on Parry Island. We were off Parry Island, the Marshalls, en route to uh, Ewell. And, uh, and he says, you know, no Marine is allowed off ship en route to combat. But he says, Joe, uh, I think I can trust you. He says, uh, uh, I'll let you go in with the supply boat, but I expect to see your ass uh, aboard uh, in a couple of hours. So I was able to visit my brother. And Parry Island is a small island, of course. And uh, so I had a sort of emotional reunion with uh, and my brother, saw all those ships out there, and he says, my God, he says, you're in for a real big one. I says, yeah. And I didn't know about this until the end of the war, because fortunately he survived too. And he told me, he said he didn't think he was going to see me. Uh, alive after well, that. He never told me that, but uh, uh, because he knew that we were close to the mainland and, and what he experienced, and he saw combat. But anyway, so uh, you're talking about after Iwo now, or yeah, what, please? Well, okay. Where were you? Let, let, let's, let's skip ahead here a little. Yeah. Where were you when you learned of the bombing of Hiroshima? Oh, okay. Well, I, I think we have to go back to, to Maui and, and, and the regrouping. Then I was assigned to another unit, which was definitely demolitions. I had mentioned, you see, once you have that combat experience, your job gets tougher and tougher, not easy. But anyway, but here's something unusual happened. Five of us, five of us were selected to go to Okinawa. Now this is, if you know your history, uh, the, the, the uh, Iwo Jima campaign ended in late March, early April, uh, late March, and the invasion of uh, Okinawa was April 1st, or east, around Easter time. And uh, so they had secured the islands, the Marines and the army invading Okinawa. And then shortly after they secured, and mind you, we had come back from, from Iwo, and then only about three or four or a month later, they assigned five of us special duty, and we thought it was TDY, temporary duty, to go to Okinawa because they were getting uh, ra uh, raids on Yontan Airfield near Naha in Okinawa. You know, the island was secured but they were getting from the mainland and from other areas, because Okinawa is, is closer to, to the mainland too. Uh, but when we got back, we were really in training for the invasion of Honshu and Kyushu. That was going to be an all-marine operation for, for those uh, objectives. So we were wondering, but I must admit, and frankly and honestly, I said, well, gee, uh, what is, well, it's temporary, but I says, why are they, we also, as uh, combat engineers, we were supposed to be what we call camouflage specialists, so we were supposed to camouflage the anti-aircraft batteries on, on Yontan Airfield. Mm. Uh, these, that's what was led to know, but I don't know, frankly speaking, it's a mystery why they pulled five of us, but in a way, I have to be honest. After the experiences we've had, and especially on Iwo, I must admit, I felt somewhat relieved. 
but then there was a bond. I says, well, it's, they says it's temporary. Uh, I'm going to still be with my division. I'm going to still be with my unit, with my buddies or the survivors of my buddies. And, but at the same time, there was a mixed emotion. I felt kind of relieved because I knew it was going to be assigned to an anti-aircraft battery. That's what the orders read. And I figured, well, okay, I've taken chances there too, but it's not going to be with the invasion of Honshu and Kyushu. And also, I am now attached to Company A, strictly demolition squad, working out with Bangalore torpedoes and satchel charges. And so I felt, yeah, we got to Yontan, and those bombers did come over. But what could we possibly do? I mean, we could uh, teach them how to make these uh, string nets, camouflage, foliage type, and so on, but that, so, I don't know. Then, answering your question directly, we heard on the uh, uh, Jeep, Tokyo Rose, uh, she mentioned a lot of things. She seemed to be very knowledgeable about what was going on with our units and uh, campaigns and so on. and. Uh, then we heard about the atomic bomb because I was out there in August and uh, well we thought well a big bomb and, uh, and then we heard that there was a second bomb and, uh, uh, and we didn't realize the full extent frankly uh, mind you you know we're uh, I'm, a, I'm with an anti-aircraft group now. I'm not with the division. And so, uh, but the point is when we learned about the end of the war, uh, even though we heard propaganda from Tokyo Rose, uh, uh, when we heard at the end of the war, uh, and we got it from the commanding officer, you know, there's a lot of scuttlebutt during these campaigns, especially towards uh, with the invasion plan for the mainland of Japan. Uh, uh, when we heard about at the end of the war, then there again, like with the time of Suribachi, then on Yontan airfield and nearby, you could hear all the firing in the air and, and, and so on, and we were so, so relieved that the war was ended. But then they wanted Marines to volunteer to disarm the, the, the Japanese in China because, you know, we were pretty close to the Chinese man. And I said, no, 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 I've survived this much through the grace of God and whatnot. Uh, no, uh, uh, I'm ready. I've got enough points. We had the point system. I said, I got enough points to go home tomorrow. And I'm not going to go there. We had, a, we had enough Japanese after the war still killing army on Saipan and these other places. Uh, uh, didn't give up even if the war was over. I wasn't going to be knocked off by some Japanese in China who didn't want to get the word. Now coming back though from Okinawa, we still had blackout even though the war because we didn't know these fanatic uh, Japanese submarines would, uh, uh, you know. But so, so that's what it is. I was on Okinawa with the artillery group when the war ended, when they dropped the bomb. I know that the Marines are notorious for not giving excessive decorations, but did you end up with any decorations as a result of your combat? Well, we had, uh, uh, for Saipan, we had the Presidential Unit Citation. Uh, and for Iwo, we had the second president unitization. But fortunately, and really, some miracle which I can't understand, because better men than me on my right, left, behind me, forward, got it. But the same, I mentioned about we lost 40. I got concussion, I got near uh, escapes and, and things of that type, but I was not wounded. I was not one. But I have to admit this, and I realize this is on tape, and it's not going to do me, but on Iwo, when we were trapped, uh, I had almost the rifle 
to my foot during daytime once. It was just a moment of in insanity, and that's all it takes, a moment of insanity. Mm -hmm. But I didn't do it. I didn't do it, not because I was a hero, or certainly I didn't think I was a coward, but I just said, I'm going to trust to it, and I can't let my buddies down. Mm. Crazy. Yeah. Okay, you, you certainly had a, a, a big say. Can you give us can you tell us what impact your wartime service had on your life subsequently? Well, I tell you what, I kept a lot of things internally, which I don't think was very good, although I wasn't aware of it. Uh, fortunately, I was able to come home to a warm family, to a friend, and a good neighborhood, and a mixed ethnic neighborhood. I mean, we, we knew each other. And, and also, having survived it, uh, I, even though I had a good high school education, I didn't think I was of college material at the time. But when my older brother got a scholarship to Cooper Union, and he was also interested in the arts, then I saw him working, and he, he was the first to initiate the GI Bill. And I saw him at night working, and then I realized it refurnished, replenished my, my creative instincts, which I had as a young kid in high school. And I began to, so I went to uh, uh, art class at Brooklyn Museum. It was like art therapy. It was, uh, you know, uh, I didn't think in terms of college education, but I, we, we were drawing again, and we were drawing for models, and, and I was t taking uh, 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 classes. And then I began to uh, build up. So. To, to make a long story short, then I began, I went to Pratt Institute in, in Brooklyn uh, for a, a two-year two, two year degree in the evening. I had uh, menial jobs. You come back, you were a kid when you left, you come back 23, 24, uh, you're still considered a kid because you have to start all over again. And I had menial jobs, but then I had an apprenticeship job and an advertising agency. So I worked with some art directors, and I went to Pratt in the evening, and all my schooling was night school, night school, night school, a long drag. And in the middle, it was hard, because all the neighborhood and buddies and my social uh, uh, guys and gals were getting married and bringing bambinos into the world and here I am a uh, struggling uh, student uh, I was always the best man but never the groom uh, but I met some very fine young ladies and I fell in love a couple of times but I couldn't support them on forty two dollars and fifty cents a week and also I said no I saw life so short 17, 18 year old just snuffed out who never even had a girlfriend, maybe. <laughs> Something more to this life. I, I gotta get I gotta get an education. I'm from a working laboring class. My father was an immigrant. He served in World War I. He got his citizenship. I see his wedding picture. He's in a US Army uniform, my mother in a white wedding gown. I worked two years in a factory, not that I don't mind manual work, but I, I said there must be something more, and I had to sacrifice. I was a survivor, uh, uh, and I was going to still survive. So I, from Pratt, I went to New York University School of Education, Art Education, night school. I hate to tell you how many years it took for me to get a baccalaureate degree and I was working on my master's because my brother was working on his master's too. So, yes, I was able to complete my baccalaureate and in those years I was able to, to uh, get a teacher's license and I taught for three years in the New York City public school system. Started in Brooklyn and uh, Manhattan and then uh, Long Island, New York. But uh, my first teaching experience uh, was on West 93rd Street, a junior high school with 3,000 students. 
and uh, new immigrants who arrived and we had problems. It was considered a delinquent school. And I don't know whether I was hired, certainly not for my stature, but I think on the record of my military experience, I don't think it was so much my academic, but my military experience that got me the job. But anyway, serious. I, had a, I could tell you a lot of stuff, but that has nothing to do with, with the war and so on, except the fact that the Marine Corps, what did the Marine Corps do? It made me stick it out. It made me stick it out. It gave me a, a form of comparison of life and death, and, and, and I began to realize, hey, you continue to sacrifice if you have a goal. And that's the way it was. We had a goal to get to that other end of the island before they pushed us back. GI Bill, you got a goal, you complete it. And uh, I got a job teaching overseas with the dependent schools, with the Department of Defense. I got a job teaching uh, on military installations in Germany. My first teaching position was in uh, Bad Nauheim. And then I was, uh, the second year I, I taught in Frankfurt. And that's where I met a, a young woman who eventually became my wife, German national. And uh, she, uh, and uh, I guess I married them young because I'm actually 11 years older than my wife. But uh, she was, as a young child, 10, 11, 12 years of age, she experienced the bombing of Frankfurt. And when I got there in, in early 50s, 54, 55, there was still a lot of debris around from, from the bombings of World War II. And uh, uh, I don't know whether it was conscious or subconscious, but there was an affinity I had with her because she experienced war. When we came back home, we didn't talk war. It's true. We were the silent generation. We wanted to get on with life. We had enough to do with killing. We wanted to get on. We really wanted to get on. We didn't want to come home, hail the conquering hero. We wanted to just get on with life, Coney Island, Saturday night dates, schooling, I, I, I certainly can understand that, that emotion. You left a lot of young friends over there. What's the best thing we could do to remember those young men and the sacrifice that they made? Well, unfortunately, our nation certainly has had additional war experiences after World War II. So I'd like to think that whether we cite World War II veterans, Korean veterans, Vietnam veterans, Gulf War veterans, that they're all remembered. Because they all had to do the dirtiest job called for. The inhumanity of war. But thank God we believe and we know and our history has proven it, that we had positive objectives. And certainly in World War II, we were fighting vicious dictatorships. So I would like to have them, because the real heroes are the ones, as you've heard, who didn't come back. Where, finally, and we don't have too many years. I am a seem energetic and healthy, but I'm 80 years of age. I was born August 23rd, 1922. I'm going to be 81 this coming August. So I would say remember them all because they deserve to be remembered. And now, finally, people are getting us to, to be a little more outspoken. And we're trying to do it, but not for ourselves. You know, the Marine Corps gives you enough glory. But I've had my share of so-called glory. I remember you talking about 
uh, I was at the nets, ready for the invasion, and this is no slur on the other service. We're dealing with individuals. Another young sailor who assisted us with the nets said, oh, you Marines, you know, because he saw all that shelling. Oh, you Marines, you get all the glory. I said, Mac, I said, I tell you what, do you want to trade places with me now? I'd be only too glad to do so. Now, I'm not saying that they didn't, I'm just talking about an individual. So that's why I'm saying I have enough glory. I'm not here for my glory. I'm here for those and for Joe Esposito because I personally knew him and we got into the Marine Corps together. But I'm here, hopefully, to represent all services and all men who fought all our wars. Well, Joe, we certainly thank you. It's been a real privilege to have you talk to us, and I'm sure that people in future years will really treasure what you had to say. Anyone else have any comments? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.